they left me alone in the DTLT office this morning, and so I decided I get to choose what we get to talk about. So this afternoon, I want to talk about an article that I just read about a New York University professor that has decided never to probe for cheating again. And I'm joined today by a friend, Zach Dow, noise professor on Twitter. Hi. How's it going, Zach? It's going well. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Right. Yeah. So I should give a basic premise for what's going on here with this. Uh, one second. I can hear myself talking. It's just driving me nuts. All right. So the professor, and I'm going to kill his name. Do you know how to pronounce his name, by the way? No, I actually never even tried. Whenever I get to a, a word like that, I just read over it as though I, and I don't even say it in my head. <laughs> All right. So I'll probably butcher this, but Panagiotis Ipirotis. Let's say that. Uh, but anyway, an NYU professor. <laughs> Uh, basically, the deal was that he had just gotten tenure, and um, he had decided that he could be a little bit more strict with his class. So he started using the Turnitin software that is built into Blackboard, and he wanted to see what students in his class were cheating. And he was really surprised, I guess, by the, um, you know, the amount of students. I think it was over 20% of his class was just blatantly disregarding and cheating on everything that they did. So he's decided, uh, he put out this blog post and he later pulled it, so I never actually got to see the blog post that he put up there. Uh, but his basic idea was that professors are, um, that there's an incentive for them not to go after cheaters. Um, at the end of the year after he had done this, which affected his course a whole lot, uh, he said that students became afraid of him because they thought that he was tracking everything they were, they were doing. And in the end, he got poor reviews from the students, and he says that that reflected um, the amount of bonus that he got, or the raise that he got next year. So um, it's an interesting idea. That, um, the first thing that I want to ask is, do you think that there's incentives um, to set up a reward for that kind of vigilance? Are you asking me? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think that there, there's a couple of things that I thought of when I read the article. One is, is I thought of, I put on my uh, teachers' union hat because I'm really active in contract negotiations on technology issues having to do with uh, in, in my district, and um, and and so it occurs to me, yeah, that in, in a lot of systems where student evaluations uh, play a pivotal role in faculty evaluation, I can see how that would negatively impact him. In my particular district, they don't play that role at all, and we were real mm -hmm. vigilant in not letting that happen. And so, for instance, in our district, student reviews can only, they are the property of the faculty member and can only be used to corroborate um, otherwise observed behavior by a peer review team. So if a peer review uh -huh. team shows up and the teacher is perpetually late, and then the students also say that, that that can be used as a, as a piece of evidence, for instance, in a disciplinary sense. But it's only things that other people saw that or you know, that, that so they're not important, essentially. They're important, right. and, and so they're yeah. phrased as though they are yeah, for the use of the instructor to help his or her teaching and whatever. Yeah, so that, that was my first thought that, I mean, is the, how much weight do you put in student evaluations in general, or should we? So yeah, and I think you know, a good point. And, and some of the comments in the article were were sort of this along that same vein, and and I just think that smile. And someone said something like, you know, or what, what are, the term for those is smile sheets, right? Smile sheets on the day of the right. final. I mean, is that really from from people who are are essentially then being treated as customers or as um, you know, it's a satisfaction survey, not anything really about teaching or learning, but how you know, entertaining or um, how able was this instructor to keep me awake until 10 o'clock on Wednesday when the class, you know what I mean? So, Right. I don't know. Yeah. On the other hand, and I think they, they, they have a use if, if for those students, and, and I've seen a lot of these having been on a, a number of peer review teams, for those students that actually put the work into, you know, trying to do a, a real and authentic evaluation, so to speak, there are some, some gems to be gleaned, but by and large the ones I've seen are just that waste of time. Yeah. Well, and the interesting thing is that 
the institution that he's with, NYU, or the specific department that he's in, countered his claim and said that anybody who was brought up with an honor code violation, their evaluations take no effect on anything. But I guess his claim is, okay, you might say on paper it doesn't take effect, but the idea that 20% of my students are pissed off at me maybe has an effect or not, I don't know. Right. As a matter of policy, it doesn't have an effect, but I'm, you know, someone reading those is certainly going to form an opinion. Right. He, he, he gave some interesting ideas for, I mean, the important part of what he wanted to bring up and really what he wants people to be discussing, and I think it's valuable, is how do you move past this idea of grades and had, well, not just grades, but this idea that you have to be constantly watching for cheating and how can you form your um, lesson plans to provide an avenue for self-monitoring? I don't know. I'd, I'll read off some things that he recommended. Um, one thing was projects be made public. He thinks that if, it, if they risk embarrassment from showing a copy of past semester's work or something, that that could have a social effect on them to where they just wouldn't do it. Um, class presentations that are graded by their peers, um, creating websites, and then rewarding based on the most clicks that they get, which makes me kind of laugh. I, yeah. You know, it goes back to like search engine optimization or something. I don't know. Uh, what do you think? Well, I, I have, I've always said when I, in my work with faculty that if, if what you do can just be bottled and put in an online context, then it probably should be. That is to say, yeah. if all you bring to the classroom can be, you know, captured in a screencast and, and you're not adding any value otherwise, this is not an anti-teacher statement, it's just a statement to get people thinking, but um, sure. then, then probably that should be the case. You know, and this is Bill Gates's position, right, is that what we'll do is we'll film all the best teachers and just make those, those films available and that will, you know, take care of this problem that we won't right. have to hire again. Khan Academy. Yeah, exactly. And, and mm -hmm. Um, so I would say the flip side of that is that if if what you're asking students to do is just something that anyone can do, then you know that that presents an opportunity to just go out and buy it. You know, so so I some of those some of his suggestions that you know I think are interesting or are, are going in the right direction. I'm not sure I concur with each one, but right. But the, the idea of putting your stuff out in a public space, I mean, that really appeals to me. Obviously, you know, DS-106, everything's out there in the open, and so we're always pushing stuff like that. But uh, I guess up until this point, he had not done much in the public, asking students to put their work online and that kind of thing. But I wonder how much effect that's actually going to have on students. Are they really going to be afraid of other students calling themselves out, or do they care? Yeah, I just, my, in reading that, I suspect that no one would care. Nobody's going to police anything that hard, and the only person that has a vested interest in that is the person that did that the previous, you know, was the author of the previous semester or whatever, and then, you know, they're not tracking on it. So I, I just, I don't see that necessarily as a, everyone's going to suddenly turn into uh, fact checkers for everybody else. I just don't think people are oriented that way. So, yeah. I mean, I, there's value in, in publicizing or, or making public um, artifacts and work product and whatever. That That is right. beside the idea of cheating, but I, I'm not sure that has anything to do with, uh, I, I'm not sure that's a remedy you, of any kind. Do you think that cheating detection has any battle, or sorry, not battle, uh, value? I mean, he says that it's a losing battle. He said, don't even try to detect for cheating. Move past that whole idea totally. Well, I, I have a, a particular um, political viewpoint about Turnitin, and Turnitin is available at my institution. <laughs> um, we use D2L, yeah. and, and in fact, this actually came up recently. I had my first paper for my class that I'm teaching was due um, Wednesday, and uh, and I was going to, on the advice of a, of a senior faculty member, that said, oh, you got to run that through Turnitin. And, I, uh, and Turnitin's available, but I never evangelize it on my campus, because here's what I think it, it is. I think it turns the presumption of innocence on its head and, yeah. um, and just says, well, I'll check all of you for um, you know, this, this unethical behavior, rather than you know, those that are, are, are uh, that sort of appear that they might have have been plagiarized, maybe running those through after the fact, but it basically subjects everyone to that. And and I have sort of political problems with that as a as a person. Sure. So that carries over to my opinion about turning it in. That being said, I think there is value in the tool itself as a mechanism for students to be able to um, 
to kind of it shines an interesting light on their work product and the, even the display and the the originality reports that it produces and mm -hmm. and how it highlights passages and wording and that kind of, I think so that's an interesting kind of in a formative sense um, something that students could use to you know churn their paper through it and go oh look you know these things aren't cited correctly or the you know as a as, as a, a working tool but I don't know I have problems with it as a you're all guilty you bastards and all right I'll find and you it, out you know if you're innocent you should have nothing to hide so why should I have a problem exactly. with it exactly Exactly. Right. Sure. Yeah, and I see both sides of it. You know, for a professor, the argument is, look, there's no way that I can know everything that's ever been put online, everything that's ever been published in a journal, and, you know, this just gives me a quick way to see whether or not there's blatant uh, theft here going on. So. Yeah, but, and, and in a, in the, within the context of a, a 60 or 160 or 300 seat lecture, you know, I understand mm -hmm. that for expediency, reasons why people are gravitate towards those kinds of systems but I just don't right. I, and on the same token if you've got a 300 seat class it's going to be hard to ask them to do stuff open and online and public you know group presentations and stuff and to you know grade them all you know what I'm saying yeah and so that kind of begs the question as to whether <laughs> the, the 300 seat lecture is right. any kind of a model for education I was at a yeah. conference recently and um, the UC is considering um, doing just what sort of the Gates and Khan Academy approach, and basically coming out with coming up with an inter-campus um, bottleneck GE courses, canned courses, so Psych 300 or whatever, and and just like doing that thing, lecture capture one, and then offer those that to three and four and five and six thousand students or m more incoming freshmen. And then just having TAs kind of monitor the the output and stuff, and just kind of cranking those out in a factory model. Right. Which which someone in the audience was like, I think that instead of that, you should just prevent the. And I'm talking about UC's University of California, but just UC shouldn't be allowed to teach freshmen and sophomores at all. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> they just shouldn't be allowed, yeah. or or only grad students, right? Because <laughs> these these thousand seat lecture halls are just not doing anything for anybody except everyone's going through the motions, I guess. Yeah, it, you said something interesting in regards to you know, this political idea of what happens when you turn that idea on, on its head and it's like, you know, you're all guilty or something. I want to read what he actually said. A portion of his blog post is in this article, and he said that uh, his campaign aroused mistrust. Students were anxious, discussions contentious. He found teaching to be exhausting rather than refreshing. Dealing with the 22 cheating cases sucked up more than 45 hours in completing unproductive discussions. And it focuses on the least deserving students, he says. Yeah, that's brutal. Which is a fair <laughs> argument, I think. brutal. <laughs> yeah. So. And this, his is a code class, though, right? Is that right? Uh, it's beginning information technology, okay. so there's probably some code in there, maybe. I just wonder if, if you know, the... The model of uh, well, I guess the other approach, and this is not the one that I'm advocating. So you either make it so that each um, work product is unique, and and you know a piece of the student is there and can't possibly be um, either because it's performance based or because of whatever, or you you simply make the assignment that their job is to go out and plagiarize the right answer. Do you know what I mean? So it's an information retrieval right. and sorting kind of a <laughs> mission. Rather right, this rote memorization, <laughs> yeah. there's a right and a wrong answer and you've got to give it. Yeah. Just go out and find all the best stuff, steal it, buy it, do whatever you need to do and then turn that in because that's really what, you know, in the world that's what the, the vast majority of people are asked to do on their daily lives. <laughs> Not come up. You should open your own university, Zach. <laughs> yeah. There's money to be made. There is money to be made. I guess not. I guess that's all coming under scrutiny now. But. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Zach, thanks for talking to me. Yeah. Thank you for having it's me. It's a good discussion. I'll be posting links to all this on the session notes that are going to go up on the DTLT Today website. And for our viewers and listeners, that is dtlttoday.umwblogs.org. And I think it should be dtlttoday.com pretty soon. Right on. So if you check back there, it might come soon. So. Thanks for joining me, Zach. Tim, my pleasure. Anytime. Thanks. And thanks for watching. Later.